Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's call, Healthy Farms and Healthy Agriculture. If you haven't done so already, please open your chat and participant panels in WebEx using the icons located at the bottom of your screen. You may submit a chat question throughout the presentation to select all panelists. If you have technical issues, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I will hand the call over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I would also like to welcome you to today's webinar. We have two speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker is Julie Smith, who's a research associate professor in animal and veterinary sciences at the University of Vermont. Julie received a BS in biological sciences, a DVM, and a PhD in animal nutrition at Cornell University. She has applied her veterinary background to programs in the area of herd health, dairy calf and heifer management, and agricultural emergency management. She also teaches the undergraduate animal welfare class required of majors in her department. Julie has conducted trainings for extension educators, livestock producers, community members on the risks posed by a range of animal diseases, whether they already exist in the United States, exist outside of the United States, or pose a risk to both animal and human health. In all cases, she emphasizes the importance of awareness and prevention. She is currently leading a multi-institutional, multidisciplinary project looking at human behavioral aspects of implementing practices that protect animal health and food security. Joanna Cummings received a DS in horticulture from the Pennsylvania State University with a specialization in vegetable crop and greenhouse production. She transitioned into the communications field after receiving an MS in environmental studies with a major in communications from Antioch University, New England. Joanna has served as research station manager at the University of Vermont Proctor Maple Research Center, education and outreach coordinator for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, marketing manager, director of communications, public information officer, webmaster, training program manager, and project manager for nonprofit, government, academic, and commercial organizations. She is currently working with the Animal Disease Biosecurity Coordinated Agricultural Project led by Julie Smith at the University of Vermont. And with that, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to Julie and Joanna. Thank you for that introduction, Liz. It's really great to be here with you, and uh, I'm glad so many have joined the call. Our three main goals for being with you today are to introduce the Healthy Farms Healthy Agriculture project and website, facilitate getting your feedback on the associated plan builder tool, and offer opportunities for you to collaborate with us going forward. I want to tell you a little bit about how I got into this area of biosecurity and emergency planning in the first place. I hadn't actually been at my position at the University of Vermont very long when I was approached by the associate dean about doing some biosecurity outreach in Vermont. This was back in 2002, and the 2001 foot and mouth disease outbreak was, was pretty fresh in many people's minds in terms of biosecurity concerns. However, in Vermont, what was on people's minds was the seizure of sheep from a farm because of concerns about a novel transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Interestingly, these two issues were captured together in an ABC Nightline report on August 13, 2001. I have the video on VCR in my office because I've used the first part of it in trainings. The first part is a video of a British farmer breaking down in tears over the loss of his herd due to the foot and mouth disease uh, control efforts, and that is followed by an aerial view of a trailer entering the National Animal Disease Center in Iowa, supposedly carrying the sheep from Vermont. I don't believe the results of the test of those sheep were ever made public, but anyway, some funds were directed to Vermont to develop biosecurity materials for farmers, specifically targeting farmers with livestock, and that was the start to my career, now spanning nearly two decades in, in this area of learning more and sharing more about biosecurity and animal emergency disease preparedness. Right now, as was mentioned, I'm nearing the end of a, a USDA NIFA-funded coordinated agricultural project uh, these coordinated agricultural projects are large. They're multi-million dollar projects. This was a five plus one year project on animal disease biosecurity. 
And we've really been focused on developing innovative approaches to understanding and influencing human behavior when it comes to taking actions that can protect animal health and prevent the spread of disease. For more on the project, I refer you to the project website, which you can find at agbiosecurityproject.org. It's agbiosecurityproject.org. There you can find a summary of presentations and recordings of videos from a symposium we conducted just about a year ago. At that time, the Healthy Farms, Healthy Agriculture website was just starting to take shape. So I really have the, uh, really appreciate having the opportunity to be here with Joanna Cummings to talk about a few key features of the site and related activities and explain how we intend our plan building tool to be used and encourage you to think about how we might collaborate to promote agricultural biosecurity. And I'd like to pause here and let Joanna say a few words of, of introduction on how she's been engaged with the project. Thank you, Julie. I came to this project um, with a, a background in plant science and uh, practice as um, in my earlier career, um, I managed a greenhouse production. Um, uh, I've had my own market garden. I worked on a lot of farms and several of those farms were uh, very diverse in terms of the crops and the animal species that were raised on them, mostly uh, all of them were small farms. So when I started working on this project, um, although I don't have an animal science background, I could relate to certain aspects of the work because of the conditions that I've seen on farms and how uh, small producers have their challenges in terms of being able to protect their their animals from diseases. So with that in mind, I also have a technology background. I've done a lot of web development and um, integration of technology into organizations. And so that skill has been very um, helpful to Julie in terms of the outreach part of the research grant. And the Healthy Farms, Healthy Agriculture website is part of that and the Biosecurity Plan Builder, which she will be talking about during this presentation, um, is uh, an, out, an output of that work as well. And so we're hoping that we can get some feedback from, your, from the participants in this webinar in, in, um, in several ways today, and uh, we appreciate your attendance. And I couldn't do this without Joanna, so let's go ahead and take a look. So we're showing you here a composite image of the home page of the Healthy Farms, Healthy Agriculture website. And you can find it at healthyagriculture.org, which is in the bottom corner of each slide. So our URL is right there for you. This branding or framing of Healthy Farms, Healthy Agriculture has carried through from that first biosecurity project that I did after coming to the University of Vermont. Meeting with the stakeholder advisors of that project, we had farmers, agritourism folks, um, even got the state veterinarian at the time, Todd Johnson involved in the project. We, we were really keen on focusing on, on the end goal, on what it meant to perform biosecurity well, which meant keeping the, the animals and the farm healthy. So we really wanted to, to focus on that aspect of being about health and maintaining health, getting there, keeping it, keeping the farm healthy, um, and provide resources to help people do that. So uh, about, boy, a year or so ago, the original Healthy Farms, Healthy Agriculture site on the UVM server had to be decommissioned because they were updating uh, a number of things. And so that gave us the opportunity to completely revamp and redesign the site get um, updated information onto the site and carry on the mission of the Healthy Farms, Healthy Agriculture Initiative. The really nice thing about this branding is that we're not restricted to a species. We're not even restricted to a kingdom. We can fit plant biosecurity in here along with animal biosecurity. And in fact, we've been visiting with some folks in the integrated pest management community about doing just that. Um, and we've also built this site with a .org extension so that we're not 
tying this information to a particular institution or part of the country. We want it to be very clear that these resources are meant for people all across the country. Um, we do, in a way, have maybe a bit of a, a target uh, orientation towards smaller farms, smaller diversified farms and ranches, and those who work with them. So the bulk of the materials on the site are, are accessible. They're, they're designed to be highly accessible and usable by producers. But we also want the folks that work with the producers to be able to access those materials and some additional training resources through the site that can help them do a really good job in working with people uh, to do the best job they can with keeping animals healthy. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, how we bring that public and private sector together um, as I walk through this graphic here. So this is a graphic of stakeholders in food and ag production from here illustrating the state institutional level to the consumer. The government agency and regulatory folks you can envision are just down the road. If this road continued off the top, top corner of the page around the corner, we'd have our regulatory and agency folks. And then we start here going along a road past kind of the academic institutions. And this is symbolizing all of those folks at land grant universities, agricultural experiment stations, veterinary colleges, and in cooperative extension, where there are folks engaged in applied research and outreach who work along with the private sector consultants, technicians, and veterinarians to engage with agricultural producers, whether they're gardeners, farmers, or ranchers, and help those production label folks, labeled here as plant and livestock practitioners, keep their crops and livestock and poultry healthy. And doing so goes a long way towards ensuring safe and healthy foods are available to consumers, who we show all the way down here in the bottom right. All right. And the reality is all of us, no matter what we do for a job, are consumers too. So we are, we are connecting these sectors and we're really focused through the Healthy Farms, Healthy Agriculture effort in connecting these people in the middle. Who are the folks that work with the farm operators employees? How do we make sure that they have the best tools and communication strategies to be effective in their messaging about adopting good biosecurity practices and appropriate biosecurity practices? So I'm putting up the next slide and we're gonna put up a poll for you here. And the first poll is uh, asking about your job responsibilities. I just want to get a sense of who's on the, the webinar today. If you would select the option or options that apply to your position, that will give me a sense of, of who's out there, all 200 of you. <clears throat> and this is time, so you get a few more seconds to put in your response. Um, on some other meetings I've been doing recently, we've had a pretty good balance between regulatory folks and extension folks. Um, I think this audience might be a little different, so I will be curious to see at the end who all has been involved. Got a few more seconds to go. Oh, and I, I suggest if, if you want to select other, like if what you do isn't listed here, uh, feel free to, to describe what you do in the chat box. Um, and I'll take a look at that later. So if we can, can we see the results of the poll? I don't know if they can share the results live. Yes, one moment. Okay. Still, still calculating results. <laughs> so we'll get that up there in a second. I'll take a look. Awesome. So we've got pretty significant number of regulatory folks. So I'm glad that you're here because we have some important questions that we want to run by you. And our next poll will be helpful in that regard. So I'm curious of, of all of you who are out there, how many of you have direct experience with helping producers develop plans or to review those plans? Is that part of your job responsibility?
<clears throat> and for those of you with experience developing plans, I'm hoping that you will be thinking as we walk through the different aspects of our tools, be thinking about the questions I have on the slide. What areas of plans are most difficult to get right or to complete in a way that makes the most sense? What elements of plans are most critical to get right so that you as a regulatory person can can issue a permit if that's what the producer is is aiming for. What aspects of plans that submitted do you feel could be strengthened? You know, maybe it's adequate. You can give them a pass, but you wish it was better in some way. What are those aspects of plans? And I've titled this slide with the saying, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. You may be familiar with this saying, and it is frequently attributed to General Dwight D. Eisenhower, and he said something quite similar, quite, quite along these lines. And I think it's really true that the planning process itself is much more valuable than the plan, and you often have to be flexible. You have to change your plan depending on how things are evolving, but if you've done a good job of planning, you'll be able to do that. So we're going to take you through the plan building process that we provide on our website. And I am, um, again, you know, we're interested in helping people do this planning process, but we know that there can be a time for the plan to meet certain standards that you are looking for so that movement permits can be issued. Um, so in that vein, we, will, we want your critical eye to look at these and we'll be asking for your responses to these questions in a survey that we'll provide a link to at the end of the webinar. And we'll use this information to do our best to ensure the site is designed to help those developing plans do a better job. So with that, we'll move on and show you what we've got on the site. <clears throat> so the organization of the majority of website content is around the mission areas of prevention, detection, and responser control. So this theme is repeated at the bottom of all the landing pages for each section. There are also species-specific sections. I don't know if you can see my pointers. Livestock takes you to species-specific biosecurity uh, information. Then there's a training section, and we also have a blog. Uh, let me get to the next slide here. You will see in the prevention section, which is the bulk of the content on this site, we are really about the prevention area of, of disease management, um, which is what the focus should be every day at the farm level, right? And we've sourced information from multiple highly uh, credible sources, including several associated with participants on this webinar, if I'm not mistaken and have repackaged it to be accessible in an online format. We are not about lists of links and PDF documents. Um, so we have a lot of resources that are, are very visual graphic um, and easy to uh, walk through on the website itself. Here you see the STAIRS acronym. So I developed this framing of key biosecurity um, considerations in the first biosecurity project that I did, and it includes the more popular IRS, isolation resistant sanitation, um, and we've got the bulk of the resources are organized around these points. Um, the stairs are the steps needed to have a comprehensive biosecurity plan or program, but they're not ordered really in importance or necessarily order of attack. And any of you who saw the original Healthy Farms Healthy Agriculture video that was produced in Vermont know that I recommend starting with the A, the assessment step. And we've incorporated assessment tools into the redesigned site as well. Uh, we also have a crisis communication plan session, section that provides a planning approach developed by the National Pork Board. What I want to dive into more deeply are the biosecurity assessment and the biosecurity plan template. Um, 
and I'll pause and see if there's give you a chance to write more questions. We're going to take your questions a little later, um, and I just want to check if there's anything that Joanna would like to add at this time. Um, the um, what I can add is, uh, and Julie will cover this later on, so the slide that she's showing you is the section of the website where we have PDF documents that a producer can download and they can fill them out online, they're a fillable form, or they can download them and um, write in the responses. But I wanted to uh, add that the content on the website and the content from the biosecurity planning resources was all gathered from sources across the U.S., mainly from Extension, uh, land-grant universities, USDA, FEMA, the National Pork Board, um, the Secure Food Supply Plans. There's a, a lot of information across the U.S., and what our, one of our goals was for the website was to gather that give the appropriate credit, of course, but also to make um, the steps for practicing biosecurity and developing plans a little bit more consistent in terms of maybe the language, um, giving those steps like the stairs um, that detect, prevent, respond, prevent, detect, respond, um, so that people could keep those easy terms in mind. And we are doing that with the planning resources as well. So it's heavily weighed on prevention, of course. Um, we are going to work on a response piece of the plan, but right now what we're rolling out is um, heavily weighed on prevention. And of course, the crisis communication plan, we go through our website and introduce the concepts of risk communication and crisis communication. And so what we've done here is the a National Pork Board has given us permission to use their crisis communication plan template. So uh, we took that and adapted it. For someone who has a uh, farm, they have employees, they may eventually have an outbreak where they would need to interact with the press, with a lot of people that are external to the farm or actually have to serve on an incident command in some way. And if you like what you see on the website, if you are in a state animal health agency that has a website, we would love for you to add a link to healthyagriculture.org to your animal health resource page and make this available to the producers in your state. <clears throat> Going next to planning resources. So the goal of the planning resources, similar to the website, is to create as well as we can, um, a one-stop shop for building a biosecurity plan, regardless of the type of livestock or poultry or maybe mixture of species on a particular premises. So as people are going through our planning resources, we do link back to our website, um, and I'll be uh, showing some bits from um, bits that are built into, I should say, that have been built into our modularized plan building tool um, in a learning management system that's been added onto the website. So these are the, the main categories of um, what someone is going to be asked to walk through. Um, there are assessments that go with many of these, and then there's planning resources that go with this. Um, and I'll show you more about that. Um, and I think what's also important to, to, for us and as we're developing our site is that we're focusing a lot on day-to-day -day biosecurity, but we also want to provide a bridge that helps connect this everyday biosecurity to what would be required in an emergency. If there was an animal health emergency, to meet the requirements of secure food supply plans in individual states. So we want to provide a tool that will result in a plan that can be presented to regulatory authorities as a prerequisite for permitting movements, for instance, in the event of an emergency. So the more um, you can help us do that, the more successful we're going to be. 
I'm going to skip ahead here. All right. So this is what the beginning of the Plan Builder tool looks like, and you need to register to be able to log in. Once logged in, someone can complete the modules that are um, in any order that they want, and they can upload documents to our server, and they will stay there, they'll be secure, or they can just keep them on their own machine, that's fine. But if they upload them, they can pick up where they left off and continue building their plan over time. Uh, the assessment and planning documents are based on what I'm about to show you. Um, so we're really keen on getting things right before finalizing and publicizing the plan builder. If you want access to it, we can give you access to it, but just recognize that right now it's still in draft form. It's not finalized. <clears throat> And we will be coming back to you to ask, um, what are areas of plans that are most difficult for people to complete or get right? What elements of plans are most critical to have right in order to allow permits to be issued? And what aspects of plans as submitted do you feel could be strengthened? In addition, anything else that you think would be helpful to getting what is needed in the event of an animal disease emergency, built into our tools, we're all over it, so let us know. So once someone logs in, they'll be able to work through it. There's a little, um, you know, it takes them through step by step, and the modules are listed on the left side, and someone can, can skip around. They don't have to do things in the order that they're listed here. I'm going to walk through pretty quickly each section of the planning and assessment resources just so you have a sense of what is included. Obviously, we have a section that starts out asking for information about the farm premises, the location, types of animals, and so on, like most plans. And we've designed this PDF as a fillable form, so when it's downloaded, the user can go ahead and fill it in, which helps make it relatively easy to use. And we refer back to a, a, a sample plan so that people don't feel like ah, there's just these blank spaces and they don't know what to do. They can look at a plan that's been filled out and think about what pieces of that apply to their own farm, what would they modify to make it a plan that, that's relevant for their own situation. I uh, just want to note related to the premises ID information that we do have on the website a table of contacts in each state for a premises ID. And we last checked on these contacts about a year ago. So if you would, I'm hoping that there's someone on this meeting from each state, if you would take a quick look and make sure that the number and the reference in the table is correct, at the current time, we would appreciate knowing if anything needs to be changed. You can see here we have cookie crumbs that show up as you're going through the website that tell you which section you're in, which, um, and exactly which page you're on. Um, so this is how you can kind of tell where you are in navigating the website. This is the, the premises map and ID page under the biosecurity plan section. We have space for people to build their plan, and we include the instructions that others have developed, and they work well for how to use Google Maps to produce your own farm's map and label it um, appropriately. This one was taken from the Secure Beef Supply Resources. Uh, we also have, uh, in two different places, we have an emergency contact list entry form. So this one is set up with cues of who should be listed. Um, and we've intentionally tried to make this comprehensive so that it's relevant to any kind of emergency on the farm, not just an animal health emergency. Um, but we also have a, a blank form so people can just fill out their emergency contact list and their own contacts in addition to these um, 
suggestions. And we have, we request the farm to designate a biosecurity coordinator. And I believe in secure food supply lingo, this is usually referred to as the biosecurity safety officer. Um, we're trying to use language that will make sense at the farm level while correlating to the requirements without putting off the producer who's filling out the form. So we want them to get through this planning process uh, as smoothly as possible. So going on to um, the people section, this is a screenshot of the first part of the biosecurity assessment related to people on the farm. And we ask for information on employees, employee training, visitors, And uh, we have um, questions that can be answered yes, no, or does not apply. And then we provide some additional information. So it's either a recommended best practice or provides a little more context for why is this an important aspect of biosecurity. So we're, we're trying to reinforce those best practices as someone is going through this process. The people assessment continues um, and asks about do they understand about different levels of risk posed by different types of visitors, what about signage, visitor log, accompanying visitors, PPE, history of travel, so this became really important when talking with certain with a number of farms in Vermont who don't they don't normally think of their farm as having exposure to any particular um, disease risks. And then we got talking about, well, you host a lot of visitors, don't you? Where are the visitors from? And they reeled off about five different foreign countries. And so that made us realize that, oh, so it's really important to to ask when a tour group is coming, where are you from? How long will you have been in the U.S. before you come to the farm? So some of these things aren't immediately evident until you start having the conversation. <clears throat> so that's the assessment side. Once the assessment side is done, they can fill in the sections of the plan document. Again, they can refer to the sample plan um, and we're planning to put some additional information into the, the fillable spaces so that they don't feel kind of put off by, oh, there's this big blank space, what, what do I put there? But to have just a little guidance to help them get started with filling in the sections. This is an example of um, what's in the sample plan. So the sample plan on our site is based on the Kansas Cattle Feed Yard Biosecurity Plan that has been updated to um, coincide with the state secure food supply plan in Kansas. And it would be really great if our Healthy Farms Healthy Agriculture site could provide links to state-based information on how animal rearing facilities can comply with secure food supply plans. So if that is through the same channels as somebody who's looking for their premises ID number, that would be simple. If it's someone else or some other process, we would appreciate that information so we can build that into the site. Julie? Yeah. Joanna. Joanna. So I thought it might be a good time to just mention some of the other sources. We use several in putting together the assessment and the plan, and uh, the first one is the um, Secure Beef Supply Plan, the Pork Checkoff Crisis Communication Plan. Uh, we use the On-Farm Biosecurity Plan from Australia as well, the Kansas Department of Agriculture's um, Cattle Feed Yard Biosecurity Guide, uh, Eden Extension Disaster Education uh, Network Farm Security Checklist, and the Center for Food Security and Public Health all hazard preparedness for rural communities guide. 
Great, thank you. So the next section for assessment and planning is around sanitation. So we have a series of questions about how is the sanitation program um, overseen, monitored, where, where are the lines of separation, how are they managed, uh, how do they select what products are used, um, and do they understand the connection between proper cleaning prior to disinfection. So we have all that built into the assessment, and then they can describe the location of their lines of separation, how those are set up, if they have cleaning and disinfection stations on a routine basis, or do they have places where they would put them. Um, that can all go into the, these planning sections. The next area is around traffic control. Um, we did a little project in Vermont to ask people to tell, you know, just to ask them if they could tell someone who's been on and off, on and off the farm in the last couple of weeks. And it was really interesting because those farmers reflected on that. They actually did a really good job. They were able to do this. But it, it made them realize just how much traffic there is on a farm. And so it really is important to have the ability to control traffic, and so we ask questions about, you know, do you have a, a plan? You know, is there a place where people should park? Are you making sure that people aren't driving through manure, getting their, their wheels contaminated before going somewhere else on the farm? Um, do they have carcass disposal plans? So that's right here under traffic control because moving large carcasses is probably going to involve large vehicles. And again, the plan form then has spaces for discussing, are there biosecurity entry procedures, biosecurity exit procedures? Put it all in the plan. <clears throat> then the next section, which is quite lengthy, has to do with thinking through different aspects of managing livestock really day to day. Um, but this also gets at are they doing things that are high risk, and how are they monitoring the health of animals on the farm? So are they able to, are they asking the right questions when they bring animals in? Are they able to isolate animals? Um, are they able to quarantine new animals? Are they able to isolate sick animals? And once they've thought about that, put in the plan. So they can talk about what are they, how do they handle new animals? How do they handle animals returning to their facility that have been off-site for whatever reason? How do they prevent sick animals from contaminating the facility and exposing other animals? How do they handle dead stock? How do they handle observation and surveillance? So these are all parts of the plan. Then we have a section on farm security. Um, this is important for a number of reasons, and our security concerns continue to evolve, um, but we want people to for sure be able to secure parts of the farm that have hazardous materials, hazardous chemicals. Do they have employee screening procedures? Um, do they, to the best of their ability, prevent uh, situations from, uh, or prevent the, the opportunity for contamination of feed with chemicals or medicines, whether that was accidental or intentional. And then do they have a plan for responding to the threat of contamination or tampering? That goes into the plan with their checklist. We also have a checklist about rodent, wildlife, and vector control. This was kind of tricky to fit in, so it just follows here because there was room for it. And we have the requisite set of record-keeping forms. These aren't necessarily forms that someone's going to use every day, but they might be. Um, but we want to make sure that, that these are available. Now, the last section of the plan that 
Joanna was referring to a few moments ago was the communications plan. So this is based off of the Pork Checkoff Crisis Communications Plan and includes helpful checklists for ste steps to take in the first hour, the first three hours, the first 24 hours, the first 48 hours, and the first week following a crisis situation for the farm. And the materials follow right through handling the, the emergency or crisis, right through debriefing and critiquing how they handled the incident. Um, we think it's great to have this as part of a comprehensive biosecurity plan or, or build this in association with a comprehensive biosecurity plan. And the crisis communication plan has a section for contact information and someone could refer back to the emergency contact list they already created as part of their biosecurity plan. So it's good to uh, have that emergency contact list and review it to make sure it covers all hazards that could trigger a need for assistance from any kind of emergency, from a fire to a power outage to an animal disease concern. At the end of completing the plan, if someone's using the plan builder, so this is set up, as I mentioned, in a learning module, learning management system that's an add-on to our website, and it's modulized. And as someone goes through it, they can take their time. There's no time limit on it. At the end, we ask for feedback. So we want to know how they, um, how they felt that it worked for their situation. So you've had a look at the, the assessment and planning tools that we have. You've learned a bit about the plan builder that we have. Now we want to just say that we're here. We want to know how we can help you reach small producers in your state. We are definitely open to partnering with states or groups of states to roll out the planning resources and tools to producers in your state. We think these can go hand in hand with the other planning um, and training tools that already exist. We think that these are, that our resources are perhaps more appropriate for smaller and diversified producers, but we've built them in a way that we think is applicable across the board. So if you think this might be a valuable resource as funding opportunities arise, please keep us in mind. And I don't know how many of you um, are concerned about how much it costs to maintain a website like this and a website that's not a static site, so meaning we're trying to keep this site fresh and use the blog and other tools to continually bring people to it. And that takes somebody's time. So in the end, to maintain the site and all the activity around it, we're talking $125,000 to $150,000 a year, right? When you count in the staff time and there's a certain amount that goes to basically maintaining the site and doing analytics and evaluating things and so on. So my funding is running out at the end of the year, so I am always looking for ways to sustain this effort. Um, maybe it's not, um, maybe it's just a pipe dream, but I'm thinking there's 50 states out there. If each state chipped in $2,500 to $3,000, we could keep this going. Um, maybe there's other approaches, so I'm, I'm all ears. So anything that that we can do to keep this going, um, I'm happy to talk with you. If if states are thinking, hey, that would be a great resource, let us know what you would expect in, in return for investing in this site. How can we keep it going? We've been doing a couple things to engage with folks and um, bring people to the site, help people know what's going on, and encourage conversations among people in the biosecurity community, so that, that middle layer that I was talking about of public and private sector folks that intersect directly with the, the farm level folks. And this spring, we held our first series of biosecurity community conversations. And serendipitously, I guess, we selected our, our topic for the first series to be 
on mortality composting. And our goal was to encourage sharing among those needing help, you know, being new at it, with those with experience. And we coupled, coupled this activity with some forums, so online forums where people can ask questions and get information and so on. Well, this topic turned out to not just be a, a good idea, but it became highly relevant as folks were dealing with high path avian influenza in turkeys and considering the depopulation of healthy stock not able to go through slaughter channels this spring as COVID-19 disrupted processing plant capacity. But we had great response to these conversations, and we've had a number of people register for our forums already. We are continuing to promote the forums. They do require registration so that everything in the forum is private. They're only accessible to members. Right now, a member can access any of the active forums, but we can actually set things up to restrict participation to a set of forums that's within what's called a category. So a category is just a way of organizing forums on the site. And members of a category would be able to participate in forums just within the category that they're a member of or any other forums that they're members of. But you could limit, you could restrict participation to a set of forums. So for instance, if you conduct a training and you want to follow up with participants and have them share next steps in a forum. So all involved with the training can track progress of the group together. We could set up a space within the forums for you to do that. So I'm going to pause here. Maybe this should say time for a tour question mark. So um, we can, uh, Take some questions now, and we'll see if there's time left to show you a few other sections of the website, but we've given you a good overall all, uh, overview already. Um, so I'm interested in seeing what questions are out there and having some conversation now before we end this time today. Okay, our first question in the chat talked about um, that you asked what the challenges are in creating and enacting biosecurity plans. And in her experience, the most difficult part of developing a plan is producer buy-in and taking the plan from paper to the real world. It's easy to write down a utopian plan for ideal farm biosecurity, but if it's too complex, then people just quit on the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so I think that you've proven that with some of your slides. Um, That's a the next big question. point to, to keep in mind that we're dealing with people who are running a business and we're asking them to think about something that hopefully they're doing every day, but give it a little more attention, but we don't want it to become overwhelming. So it, it has to make sense in the context of the business. Julie, can I add something on to that? Sure. I think the, um, and this was part of the research for the ADB CAP project that Julie is directing is the incentives and what incentivizes um, producers to be able to do the right thing. And so we certainly have thought about the possibilities of maybe, you know, this would require funding of offering some already made plastic signs, biosecurity signs, if they complete a plan. Um, having the benefit of our plan being approved as part of um, being submitted for secure food supply uh, planning purposes, I think is another great incentive. So we certainly are interested in suggestions from you as well for incentivizing uh, the benefits of, of producing a plan. Okay, we have another question. Have you done any follow-up with anyone that has built a plan to see what level of implementation on the farm they have achieved? Oh, that's a great question. We are not to that stage yet here. Um, and it's one of the things that we want to do through, uh, I'm applying for some funding now, but we're hoping that we'll get funds to do some piloting of this plan building tool so that we can have that kind of follow up with folks. Okay, there's a couple comments about it's an excellent presentation. Thanks for the resources. Um, another question is how do you prevent animal activists from infiltrating the forums? 
Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. So we do ask some questions at the time when people register. So hopefully we can screen those people out. If we learn that materials are being used inappropriately, we can remove people from the forum. So it's, as with all of our protections against activism, it may not be perfect in, the, in a preventive sense, but we are proactive in, in taking appropriate steps to minimize that from being a problem. And I, Julie, I just wanted to add that right now the forums are set up for the um, audiences specifically. The forums are private, of course, like Julie said, but they're specifically for people that like the audience we're talking to today on this webinar. So we're not engaging with the public um, on the forums. It's mainly for people who are talking to producers and regulating them. And so some of the questions that we're asking, you think, well, maybe somebody could fake the answers. But I'm also looking at their, the, their, their email addresses, you know, a .gov or a dot from a state agency or a government agency or from an organization that we're familiar with helps a lot in terms of being able to know that these people are not going to cause the, the issues that the question is directed toward. Okay, we do have another question. It says, producers can often provide advice to each other that may be detrimental or incorrect. Mm -hmm. How would this be handled in the forums? So again, the forums are not uh, meant for production level people directly, um, but for the folks that work with them. And so it's a great opportunity for us to identify where people might have misconceptions. And by having this blend of folks with more experience and those with less experience in the forum, we can help share the information that is considered, at least from those folks that we've identified as experts, to be the most accurate information to be going forward with. Because the reality is that we want to also be sharing things that people are doing that are innovative. You know, there's a lot of things that we have to do you know, we've found some actually related to our discussions of mortality management where people are trying to find approaches that will work in particular situations. And so they might be trying something that someone else might not think would work, right? But they're going to try it and see if it works. And then they can share how did it go. And so that helps expand the, the knowledge and the tools that people have available. So we do have one more chat question, and then we'll kind of open it up for verbal questions if there are any. It says, will all species have specific resistance recommendations, vaccinations slash tests? I was looking for this for the swine and cervids. Yeah, thanks for that question, Carol. So we don't intend to be a, how would you say, a prescriptive site. So we're trying to minimize having um, specific guidance, particularly around pharmaceuticals. Uh, we want people to talk with their veterinarian who best understands what the local situation is, what are the issues of most concern that they should be protecting their, their herd or flock against. Um, we want the site to focus on the other aspects of management that influence, that support animal health. Um, with the idea that hopefully if we do a good job there, we can minimize the need for um, other types of purchased interventions. Okay. Um, are there any verbal questions? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a verbal question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad. We do have uh, some lining up into the queue. One moment. Call your lines unmuted. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks. Uh, so, hi, Julie and Joanna. This is Jane Rooney. I'm uh, the director of One Health in, in Veterinary Services, um, APHIS. Um, great uh, site, and I actually went to it uh, myself. But 
because uh, of COVID-19, we've been looking for resources um, that we can provide to people on general biosecurity and how to, um, you know, set up biosecurity um, on all different sorts of uh, premises. Um, mm. So I really appreciate that. Also, um, and I'd, I'd love to talk to you offline, actually, about some other things. Also, just wanted to say um, I was deployed to uh, California last year and was working on the biosecurity aspects and building plans and whatever. So I would um, say if you haven't spoken to um, California CDFA, if anyone's on the line, I know they have a lot of experience of building um, biosecurity plans and trying to assess them um, on small entity farms um, that I think could be quite useful feedback. Right, great, great. Thanks for that comment, Jane. Glad that you're on and look forward to talking with you after. Thanks. And ladies and gentlemen, if you do have any more questions, you can please press pound two on your telephone keypad. We have no questions in the queue at this time. And then no more chat questions. So I think, um, Julie, you can go ahead and um, continue. Great. Well, we are almost at the end of the hour, so I am um, uh, not going to take you on a, a deeper dive of the site. I encourage you to visit the site, healthyagriculture.org, and do check out the assessment and planning tools and let us know ways that we can uh, make those more useful and not just at the farm level, but at the at the regulatory level if someone's presenting you a plan. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Dr. Lori Miller for the opportunity to be with you here today, and we appreciate your feedback. We hope that you will go to the feedback form and answer those questions that we've had you thinking about as we walk through our planning and preparedness tools. And we look forward to partnering with you to enhance preparedness and planning in the animal production sector. So I guess I'll conclude by saying be well and biosecure. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, on behalf of the National Training and Exercise Program, I'd like to thank Julie and Joanna for the presentation today. And also thanks to everyone who attended the webinar. Uh, the NTEP's next webinar is on Thursday, May 28th at 11 a.m., and the topic is the National Veterinary Stockpile Resource Ordering. And also, just to remind everybody, if you have ideas for webinars that the NTEP can explore for our emergency preparedness community, please feel free to contact us. Um, you can find recorded webinars on various topics on the TEP video gallery at USDA APHIS website. And with that, I will say have a great afternoon and uh, hopefully you'll join us next Thursday. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today's conference and thank you for using event services. Your conference is now ended and you may disconnect.